Hi everybody, so I found this article because I decided to look into um, how everything is going with regards to the coronavirus uh, in Puerto Rico because I really haven't heard too much news about it. So I figured, let me look this stuff up myself because, um, you know, I have been hearing how um, certain communities have been being hit because of the virus. Unfortunately, I I've heard... Um, I've heard Christina touch on how it's hitting the Dominican Republic really hard. Um, I've heard within um, this country that um, I think it was, I think I heard it was about 35% of the deaths that have happened due to the coronavirus have been um, black Americans. And it, it's so horrible that um, you just, you just see the proof how um, it, it's really the, the poorer groups that are getting hit, so, you know, the hardest um, with this virus. Uh, more so than anyone else. Um, but anyway, I figured I would talk about this because I found this and I know that um, some of the people that come to this channel are probably going to find this to be too much of a very uh, leftist sort of article, but I did find it interesting and, you know, I'll kind of um, voice my opinions on it um, after I'm done reading it. So it's uh, titled Colonial Colonialism made Puerto Rico vulnerable to coronavirus catastrophe. If Washington keeps ignoring the U.S. territory, it could spell disaster. Okay? So, here it starts. The New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, the Associated Press, Reuters, ABC News, NPR, The Guardian, Al Jazeera and Business Insider have all published maps tracking the spread of, of COVID-19 across the United States. None of them have included the entire country in their graphics. Missing are all or most of the five non-state U.S. territories, four of which have confirmed cases of the novel coronavirus. Novel, excuse me. Even though they're home to more than 3.5 million U.S. citizens and nationals, and they're administered by the U.S. government, the territories, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and Northern Mariana Islands, and American Samoa are often forgotten. During this crisis, inattention from the mainland in the form of disregarded pleas for supplies, funds, or relief from the colonial framework could spell disaster. For Puerto Rico especially, the largest U.S. territory with 3.2 million U.S. citizens residents, its second-class status is proving massively consequential as it tries to contain and treat a coronavirus outbreak. Decades of exclusion from the full benefits of federal programs has chipped away at its hospital network. Hurricanes Maria and Irma in 2017, earthquakes this year, and the federal government's lackluster response to both have further damaged the territory's health infrastructure. The island's debt crisis and the swooping in of vulture funds has stripped Puerto Rico's government of budgetary autonomy, which could hamper its ability to fund its emergency response. If coronavirus catastrophe hits, the federal government's culpability will be undeniable. Yet, even with Washington and Wall Street working against it, Puerto Rico's officials, healthcare workers, citizens, and diaspora are mounting a defense against the coronavirus. As of today, the island has 573 confirmed infections and 23 deaths, facing its third major public health crisis in as many years. The territory is hoping to prevent a worst-case scenario, overrun hospitals, economic collapse, and thousands of deaths. In now ubiquitous epidemiological talk, preventing a health care system from being overwhelmed requires a society to do two things. Flatten the curve, that is, slow the rate of infection so there aren't too many cases that need hospitalization at one time, and raise the line, that is, boost the hospital system's capacity to treat large numbers of patients. In terms of raising the line, Puerto Rico is at a severe disadvantage as decades of privatization, decreased tax revenue, and shortchanging from federal programs have taken a toll on the island's health care system. In 1993, then-Governor Pedro Rosello, father of Governor Ricardo Rosello, who stepped down in August after a mass insurrection, 
launched an enormous health care reform project. His stated goal was to improve access for Puerto Rico's poor, but instead of boosting the island's public hospital infrastructure, he moved the system closer to the mainland model, privatizing most of the health care providers while leaning heavily on federally subsidized programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program. Today, roughly 45% of Puerto Rico's population is covered by Medicaid or CHIP, compared to about 20% of the overall U.S. population, while another 20% relies on Medicare. Despite these federal programs being pillars of Puerto Rico's and the other territories' health care systems, the federal government denies them adequate and equitable funding. This is especially true of Medicaid. In the 50 states, Washington funnels money to each individual Medicaid program based on the state's median income, paying anywhere between 50 and 83% of the annual bill. For the territories, however, the original 1965 Medicaid legislation stipulates that the federal government pay a set low rate, only 55%, forcing cash-strapped territorial governments to front nearly half the cost. On top of that, unlike the in the states, federal Medicaid funds for the territories have an annual ceiling. So after a territorial Medicaid program spends a certain amount of federal money, the local government is on the hook for all Medicaid costs for the rest of the year. Given its reliance on Medicaid, Puerto Rico almost always surpasses the ceiling. In recent years, the territory has ended up paying upward of 80% of its, medical bu- of its Medicaid bill. Making matters worse, The Rosello reforms coincided with an economic crisis. Beginning in 2006, the year Washington fully phased out a set of tax initiatives, I mean, excuse me, incentives for manufacturers on the island, the Puerto Rican economy began contracting, and with it, the tax base that that the local government used to pay its share of Medicaid and other health programs. To prevent healthcare catastrophe, in the territories, Congress has provided bills of dollars and ad hoc funding in recent years, but it hasn't been enough. On Puerto Rico, the average Medicaid enrollee receives less than 2200 in benefits per year, lower than any state, while the median state's enrollees average more than $6,700. Furthermore, additional funding from Congress often arrives on an emergency basis, relegating territorial Medicaid programs to a never-ending cycle of crisis. In December, the territories narrowly avoided the most recent fiscal cliff when lawmakers allotted two years of additional funding just as exiting funds were running out. They cut it so close that American American Samoa's Medicaid office, which covers four-fifths of the territory's residents, had to pause a life-saving program that sends patients, including those with cancer, who need care beyond what the territory can provide to New Zealand for treatment. Wow. This persistent underfunding paired with the unpredictability of future funds has taken a toll, not just on the financial stability of the territory's Medicaid programs, but on the integrity of their health system as a whole, making it more likely they'll be overwhelmed by COVID-19. In Puerto Rico, the funding issues have yielded extremely low reimbursement rates for providers, which has led to low pay and an exodus of healthcare professionals. From 2006 to 2016, the number of doctors on the island fell from 14,000 to 9,000, a percentage decline four times greater than that of the general population. Wow. We only have 9,000 physicians. We have a shortage of nurses, says Dr. Victor Ramos, president of Puerto Rico's College of Physicians and Surgeons. This is going to be an issue, especially when the health professionals start to get sick. The funding problems have also weakened hospital infrastructure. As Jamie Pla Cortez, executive president of the Puerto Rico Hospital Association, explained to Congress last May, the sporadic short-term payments to the territory's Medicaid program have made banks hesitant to finance much-needed physical improvements. Many hospitals on Puerto Rico, for instance, have been modernized since haven't been modernized since they were built in the 1940s, according to a 2017 study by the Urban Institute. We're always responding, always reacting to when things happen, complained Hector Hernandez Delgado, staff attorney at the National Health Law Program. We're not providing the territories with the resources to put infrastructure in place for when 
outbreaks happen. Since raising the line is such an uphill battle for Puerto Rico, it is critically important that the territory succeeds in flattening the curve. But on that front, Puerto Rican government's response to the crisis has been at best chaotic. As confirmed cases of the of the novel coronavirus began to spike on the continental U.S. in early March, the administration of current Governor Wanda Vasquez received flack from advocates and the public for failing to take preemptive measures to slow its inevitable spread on the territory. In particular, residents blasted Puerto Rico's health secretary, Rafael Rodriguez Mercado, for comments he made late in late February downplaying the likelihood that the coronavirus would even reach Puerto Rico. Rodriguez Mercado stepped down on March 13th, the same day the governor announced Puerto Rico's first confirmed cases of COVID-19. Less than two weeks later, his replace his replacement, Concepcion Quinones de Longo, also resigned. Wow. Two days after Puerto Rico confirmed its first COVID-19 cases, Governor Vasquez imposed a curfew and ordered all non-essential businesses closed. But the rate of new infections on Puerto Rico is still accelerating. It took 15 days for the territory to register 100 confirmed cases, but only three days to register 100 more. If places like New York City and Lombardy, Italy are guides, baseline social distancing measure may not be enough to avoid overwhelming an infected area's hospital system, especially ones as vulnerable as Puerto Rico's. To sufficiently flatten the curve, the territory may need to undergo a widespread testing and and contact tracing campaign, similar to that seen in South Korea. However, neither the federal government nor any state government has anywhere near the number of COVID-19 tests needed to to conduct such a campaign. So Puerto Rican officials have been attempting to procure tests from abroad. After an initial debacle with the island's first positive COVID-19 tests, The Puerto Rican government claimed that it was purchasing hundreds of thousands of rapid result tests from China and Australia, but the procurement of the tests has been mired in confusion and doubt. For nearly a month, no one could confirm the details of an initial order of 200,000 tests, whether the order was actually being filled, whether tests were uh, approved by the Food and Drug Administration, or whether the federal government would reimburse Puerto Rico for them. On Sunday, the newest health secretary, Lorenzo Gonzalez, began telling media that the tests were finally arriving on the island, but it's still unclear when they'll be ready for use. Amid widespread frustration regarding the state of 200,000 tests last week, the government announced that it had placed an order for 1 million more. But on Sunday, Gonzalez revealed that the government was canceling that 38 million in order million order because the tests weren't FDA approved, sparking further anger. <laughs> Puerto Rico's largest wi- largest newspaper, El Nuevo Día, also reported that the company through which the government ordered the million tests, a small construction firm that has never before sold medical products, has close ties to the governor's new progressive party. The newspaper also presented evidence that the company's selling tests to the government have been engaging in price gouging. Gonzalez faulted a previous a previous health secretary for the fiasco, but didn't specify which of his two recent predecessors is to blame. In addition to what was supposed to be an, an ambitious testing campaign, the Puerto Rican government announced on March 23rd an economic rescue plan, totally $787 million. The plan will fund the salaries of public employees, give cash to self-employed workers, extend unemployment benefits, Deliver, deliver $30 million to public hospitals and provide teachers $240 million to facilitate distance education, among several other measures. Though the package will surely prevent economic devastation for many Puerto Ricans in the short term, it's still nowhere near enough, according to Federico de Jesus, a senior advisor to Power for Puerto Rico, a coalition of liberal, labor, and advocacy organizations that includes Unidos U.S., Make the Road, New York, the Center for Popular Democracy, and the Center for American Progress. To save their islands from economic and health disasters, U.S. territories will need to keep implementing new measures. Unfortunately, they face hurdles in enacting such measures. The most glaring one for Puerto Rico is the Financial Oversight and Management Board, or La Junta, as disapproving residents call it. Created in 2016 as a policing authority for Puerto Rico's 
restructuring, the FOMB wields veto power o- over almost everything the island government does with its budget. In particular, the board's loyalty to bondholders on Wall Street has been a massive impediment to Puerto Rico's post-Maria and Irma recovery efforts. And there's still little reason to think that it won't showcase the same behavior during the pandemic. That's why advocates are calling for the federal government to roll back the FOMB's authority or, in the case of power for Puerto Rico, abolish it outright. We've been calling for the abolition of the junta because through these crises... Austerity has been so incompatible with the emergency response, said De Jesus. He points to nearly $9 billion the board has forced the Puerto Rican government to earmark for future debt payments, money essentially sitting in a bank account that could help with the COVID-19 response. It shouldn't be going to bondholders in Wall Street, he said. They're hoarding all this cash instead of releasing it to help people in their time of need. Powerful Puerto Rico is also calling for the U.S. government to cancel the island's debt to its creditors. The Jesus called the money owed an impediment to respond to the coronavirus because that's money not spent to shore up the health care infrastructure. In addition to debt, territories must overcome colonial provisions in federal law that can make it difficult to take swift action during an emergency. In March, for example, the Federal Emergency Management Agency waived a section of 1933 by American Act that could have prevented the federal government from reimbursing certain territories for emergency supplies like COVID-19 tests that they purchased from foreign countries. However, the 2019 Jones Act remains in effect. This legislation mandates that only American-owned, American-made ships with American crews can carry cargo between U.S. ports, making Puerto Rico's imports disproportionately expensive. Advocates worry that it can make obtaining emergency supplies costly and complicated. Meanwhile, the territories must watch out for ways in which they might be left out of federal emergency bills, a tall task given their lack of voting representation in Congress. Some such exclusion could be accidental. After Congress passes its $2.2 trillion Emergency Cares Act in March, which included increased funding for employment benefits, Guam's government had to scramble to find a way to become eligible since the island has never had a traditional unemployment benefits program. Other times, however, the legislative marginalization is deliberate. While the CARES Act funnels no less than $1.25 billion in direct relief to each state, the five territories in Washington, D.C. together have, have to split $3 billion, around $700 per capita compared to, for example, more than 9600 per capita for Montana. U.S. territories have a difficult battle ahead, and for Puerto Rico, this pandemic is just the latest um, tribulation. We have fresh lessons in our memories and in our minds that we learned during the management and response to Maria and Irma and the earthquake, said Antonio Fernandez, board members of Latinos for Healthcare Equity and longtime healthcare administrator, on Puerto Rico. We discovered through our experiences the spirit of solidarity and the tremendous sense of support that our local communities give to one another in times of crisis. So that's it. And uh, yeah, this this definitely doesn't, this don't really sound good. Um, I mean, and I'm not surprised I'm not surprised, you know, I, I, and the thing is, is like, there's not enough tests going around over there, obviously, the same way that there's not enough tests going around over here, but over there, it's got to be even worse, right? Less funding, way less uh, testing going on over there. So, you know, they, they think it's 500 and something or 600 and something, and you don't even know if it's more than that, right? We don't even know if the cases that we have, they're... You know, there's so many un, uh, you know, unaccounted for cases here. So I, I can't imagine the same thing not happening over there, but possibly on a larger scale. Uh, but you know, I, I, I kind of figured that you know that this was gonna happen over there, and especially with, with their, with their already, um, their already high uh, debt. You know, I really don't foresee this going well over there unless there's some uh, there's some miraculous vaccine that pops up out of nowhere. But um, I 
even that, like I even have a, a hard time foreseeing that happening too soon. And if it does happen, who knows how long it's going to take for that to be distributed to everybody, right? But, um, you know, as, as far as the people go over there, you know, I'm not surprised that this is happening. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Like, I read this and on the one hand, it's like, because I always talk about how I don't, I don't like getting into things that go on over there. Things, you know, that, that, that happen in the island. But on, on the other hand, it's like, It's just, if if I'm not hearing about it on the news, it's like, why, you know, why is it that, why is it that I felt like I had to look into it because I, I don't know, I was like, I'm not hearing about it. So I had to go search for the information myself, you know? And so I found that to be kind of, well, not strange, but I just, I just kind of knew that, you know, that the island was going to be put on the back burner, basically. So, anyhow, I thought this was an interesting share. Pray for the people that are on the island. They're already going through so much over there. Um, and it's just it's just back to back with things that that are that are going on over there. It just it's nonstop for those people, and it, it's terrible. But um, I'm gonna go for now, and I guess I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.